Good afternoon and welcome to another Research in Action. Uh, my name is Karen Scapinado. I work in the Division of Research at Florida Atlantic University and welcome you to, today, to today's session. With that, it is my very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Sandra Washington specializes in 19th and 20th century African-American literature. Particularly, she focuses on Black girlhood and the ways in which race and gender-related violence and trauma affect African-American female children and adolescents. Dr. Washington also founded the Black Girlhood Project, which is a digital humanities resource designed to enhance the emerging interdisciplinary field of Black girlhood studies and to offer scholars and researchers a centralized location for networking and information on Black girls. With that, Welcome, Dr. Washington. I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Scarpinato and her team at the Division of Research here at FAU for inviting me to give this talk. And I'd also like to thank all of you for attending and being interested in my research and also in Black girls. And I look forward to our Q&A session later. Um, so I'd like to begin my talk by offering a bit of background about my interest in Black girlhood studies uh, generally and Black girls in literature particularly. As an African-American woman and the mother of an African-American daughter, several years ago, I began searching for literature that centralized Black girl characters. I hoped to encourage my daughter to develop an appreciation for books and storytelling, but this was a surprisingly difficult undertaking for me and for the various librarians I consulted and conscripted along the way, as so few of those books seemed to exist at that time. Of course, oh, I, I meant to share my uh, screen. I've been just talking away. <laughs> okay, let me show you, do that. Here we are. Okay, so yeah, and that's a nice little picture of my daughter, like her own. Uh, her uh, side view. So, um, so, of course, now parents and children have the benefit of efforts such as these, which are designed to increase uh, the public's awareness of diverse literature. Yet these project, projects are relatively new, and none of them existed even 10 years ago. Still, I was so committed to locating books on Black girls because although I am currently a literary scholar, at one point in my life, I became disenchanted with reading. I found that I had so little in common with the characters in books that my teachers and professors frequently assigned that I lost interest. So my goal was to prevent that from happening in my daughter's life and to show her that people like her were interesting and important, that they were beautiful and ugly too, as poet Langston Hughes so eloquently stated in his 1926 essay, the Negro and the Racial Mountain. Fast forward to many years later, after clearly I rediscovered my love of reading, I became aware that although my interest in Black girl characters remained strong, and of course I had noticed Black girls in books that I'd read previously, but initially their presence or absence in the literature made no significant difference to me or to my scholarship. Then, in a course on the renowned uh, 1980s Black writers, I reread Alice Walker's The Color Purple and truly contemplated young Seeley and the very specific struggles she faced due to the intersection that, uh, of her race, gender, youth, societal positionality, and the abusive environment that she endured. On the very first page of the novel, Seeley remind God that she's always been a good girl. And she pleads with God to help her understand her life and struggle at only 14 years old. Those words jumped off the page for me and I realized a few things. First, that Celie's intersectionality left her particularly vulnerable, especially during a time when the rights of African-American women and children were minimized or altogether denied. I also became cognizant of the fact that as devoted as I had been to locating children's books on black girls, I was commonly 
I commonly overlooked, oversimplified, or completely ignored Black girls in adult literature. And finally, I realized that I was far from alone in that regard. These new insights ignited a passion in me for researching Black girls in literature. But as research often does, my efforts revealed new issues. I discovered that for years, many authors had either neglected, minimized, or created one-dimensional Black girls in literature. And they often included their stories as context or backdrop for adult characters. Further, I realized that critics commonly overlooked African-American female children and adolescents in their scholarship, except when using the designation Black girl to loosely describe adult Black women and children alike. As a matter of fact, when Googling or using other web-based tools um, in searches for Black girls, more often than not, the information provided and the photographs provided will be of Black women. Also, there are many organizations and outreach efforts that include the words Black girl in their name, but they heavily focus on Black women. Now, don't misunderstand me. I follow and subscribe to many of these organizations, and I think that they are doing great work. However, they are not particularly helpful to me in researching Black children and adolescents who are female. And at times, I feel like that they can kind of silence that portion of, um, of people's attention. Nevertheless, I located many examples of literature featuring Black girl characters, and I focused on how I might challenge my previous readings of them. Instead of simply noting Linda Brent's suffering and journey as the recollections of a formerly enslaved adult Black woman in Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, I considered her commentary about Black female enslaved children and the prevalence of their unfathomable mistreatments and experiences. Brent states, everywhere the years bring to all enough of sin and sorrow, but in slavery, the very dawn of life is darkened by these shadows. Even the child, the little child, will learn before she is 12 years old why it is that her mistress hates such and such a one among the slaves. She will become prematurely knowing an evil thing. Soon, she will learn to tremble when she hears her master's footfall. She will be compelled to realize that she is no longer a child. If God has bestowed beauty upon her, it will prove her greatest curse. That which commands admiration in the white woman only hasten the degradation of the female slave. I also reconsidered teenage Winter Santiago, the self-proclaimed boss bitch and eldest daughter of a high-level drug dealer. As she begins narrating her life story, she realizes that her readers will prejudge her and she states, let me make it clear who I am and where I stand. Don't go jump into any conclusions either. Don't run ahead of me. Let me take my time and tell my story. And even though she instructs us not to jump to conclusions, that is exactly what so many readers and critics have done in assessing her as a woman and ascribing to her all of the stereotypes associated with Black womanhood. Rather than reading her as a teenager, which is what she is. So Black girls in some novels are more difficult to overlook. For instance, Claudia in Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye State, adults do not talk to us. They give us directions. They issue orders without providing information. We do not hear their words, but with grown-ups we listen to and watch out for their voices. We do not, cannot know the meaning of all their words, for we are nine and 10 years old. So we watch their faces their hands, their feet, and listen for truth in timber. So most people would agree that these are children and that the events that occur in this novel are horrific. Um, also, people would agree that what happens to uh, the children in The Darkest Child by Dolores Phillips is horrific. Um, Tangie May, who is the protagonist who narrates the story, explains of her sister, Martha Jean, 
that her most profound lesson had been learning through a curriculum of intimidation and pain. In fact, we had all been students in that classroom with our mother as our teacher. We work as a silent, defeated army, beaten down by our mother, tending our wounded. We do not retaliate, for our victory is inconceivable. Later in the novel, after her mostly absent father tells her, you too young to lose your mind, you just a little girl, sugar, and you don't even know it. She shares, I smiled at that because we both knew that I hadn't been a little girl for a long time now. But she is a little girl. By the end of the novel, she's just graduating from high school. And it's difficult for people both within that novel and outside of it to contemplate that this type of thing could happen to a little girl. But this tendency to show these characters suffering occurs across eras from um, Harry Jacobs' um, slave narrative all the way to the, this uh, relatively recent piece by Dolores, Dolores Phillips. So, but after locating so many of these types of characters and meeting with other scholars who were also interested in Black girlhood, that inspired me to create the Black Girlhood Project to enhance this emerging interdisciplinary field um, of Black girlhood studies. I wanted to offer scholars and researchers a centralized location for networking and information sharing on Black girl characters initially. So as you can see there, it says highlighting Black female children and adolescents in literature. So my initial focus was solely literature. And then after I realized the interdisciplinarity of the field, I expanded it. Um, the site offers methods by which interested parties can interact and a small, small blog on Black female children and adolescents in literature. The blog was uh, the smallest portion because I was actually trying to finish my dissertation and didn't have a whole lot of time <laughs> to devote to writing blog posts, but um, I was hoping that it would spark people's attention and it did. Uh, many people replied uh, favorably to the site and wanted to be of assistance in the project's work. Um, but the most important element of the project is a growing reading list of creative and scholarly texts portraying and analyzing Black girls in general. Recently, I was awarded an FAU Research Initiation Grant to continue this work and with the help of several undergraduate research assistants and also um, I've been able to expand it, but also as an affiliate faculty uh, for the Center for Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies, I'm able to work with a graduate student who's also been integral to that effort. And so we've been able to compile a list of nearly 2000 sources that relate to black girls. What I found was that much of that information that was pre-existing beyond a few years ago was really trying to diagnose the problems associated with black girls. So many of the scholars approach black girls as problems to be solved, whether in the educational system, societally or in the legal system. This was some of the more pre prevalent work, but recently people have been kind of broadening their understanding and appreciation for all of the different intersections of black girlhood and the, the need to really focus on them as people who are in need of assistance rather than problems to be solved. So, and as I was working on my research, other scholars in various disciplines, education, sociology, legal studies, to name a few, have been doing the same thing. So in this very now famous um, Georgia, Georgetown Law Report, um, Rebecca Epstein, Jamila Blake, and Thalia Gonzalez, um, have defined the word adultification and they define it as the perception of black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than white girls of the same age. So here are some of their findings. It's a snapshot of the data. Um, they found that black people thought that black girls were less nurturing, less in less need of protection. They need to be less supported, le less comforted, more independent. They need to know more, they know more about adult topics, they know more about sex than um, white girls of the same age. And this has really 
impacted the way that people perceive Black girls, but also in whether or not they supply them with uh, the various resources that are necessary for them to thrive. So the problem, this is the problem that I've noticed in literature as well, which signals the impact of culture, of, of culture on literature and vice versa. So I coined a term called the black girl woman or black girl womanhood, which represents a female character whose mental development is or has been interrupted or stagnated by traumatic experiences suffered during her formative years. And those I identify Pecola and, you know, in the blue sky, Susie in the color purple, winter in the cold winter ever, um, and many other black girl characters as being black girl women, because oftentimes people see them as more adult-like, they adultify them, and they don't really consider the trauma that these uh, children have suffered and that they carry with them into their adult years. So um, these difficulties that uh, black girl women face force them to behave as women or perform various duties associated with womanhood despite their chronological ages. And my theory of black girl womanhood offers scholars a new paradigm with which to consider literary depictions of black female youth in a more comprehensive manner. It expands academic discourse on a population that is regularly excluded from these conversations and it affirms and reaffirms the importance of African-American girls, not as soon to be black women, but as individuals worthy of consideration in their own right. All of these efforts reveal the importance of further research on, on black girls. And it is my hope that as I and other scholars engage this topic that we will consider um, new ways to, um, to really meet the needs of Black girls, both in life and in the literature that reflects their life. Um, so I think that there has been a lot of uh, movement in that regard of late, and you may have been seeing some of these things. Um, this book, Binti by Nettie Okorafor, talks about the idea of black girl future. And she presents the character Binti, who is considered to be the pride of her people and that she's a harmonizer rather than a destructive force in society. She's also very um, prideful about her, her culture. And she has this ojutsu that she wears in her hair, which you can see here on the image. It's being reflected this orange um, material that they put on their hair. But only, she says, only my people wear it and I'm the only one of my people on the ship. My people are sons and daughters of the soul and it's beautiful. So she has this pride in herself and she um, is adamant about retaining that pride among the various trials that she's experiencing. There are many other opportunities and, and offerings in that regard uh, there was recently even a, a film, a series on Netflix called Cannon Busters, which was an anime which featured a black protagonist, a black girl protagonist, but she's a, she's kind of this um, part human kind of android person. And she um, emits a ray from her mouth to defend herself, but she's unaware of it. So she's this really happy-go-lucky kind of character, which is really interesting to see um, you may remember Ava DuVernay's A Wrinkle in Time adaptation in which she changed Meg from a white character represented in the book to um, the black character Stormy Reed. And she is um, doing, having all these adventures in the, you know, the world that we know and then outside, outside that world and in other worlds. So that's interesting to see as well. So there's a lot of, of work being done um, toward all of this, uh, this black girlhood futurism. Um, and, and one of the books that I love the most right now is by Renee Watson, 
she's written a book called Piecing Me Together. And in that book, she presents characters that challenge our perspective about where they live, who they are, what their interests are, whether they're intelligent or not. It's so many different options that she's offering us in different ways to see Black girls. And so I want to share a poem from that book that Renee Watson wrote, but she wrote it as a character called Lily Simmons. Um, and it talks about this Black girl futurism. So the poem is Black Girls Rising. And I'll read it. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see the font. Our Black bodies sacred, our Black bodies holy, our bodies our own, every smile a protest, every laugh a miracle. Piece by piece we stitch ourselves back together. This Black girl body that gets dragged out of school desk, slammed onto floor, tossed about at poolside, pulled over and pushed onto grass, arrested, never to return home, shot on doorsteps, on sofas while sleeping and dreaming of our next day. Our bodies, a quilt that tells the story of the middle passage, of roots yanked and replanted. Our bodies, a mosaic of languages forgotten, of freedom songs and moaned prayers. Our bodies no longer disregarded, objectified, scrutinized, our bodies our own, every smile a protest, every laugh a miracle, our bodies rising, our feet marching, legs dance, dancing, our bellies birthing, hands raising, our hearts healing, voices speaking up, our bodies so black, so beautiful, here, still, rising, rising. And so you can see that this poem shows the struggle, but also the beauty and the hopefulness of a different future for Black girls. So it is my hope that with, with my work, that I can be a part of the change, the shift in this narrative about Black girls, that we can stop seeing them solely as these children dragged out of these deaths and, and um, pinned down by police officers or people who have to be kind of placed in certain types of situations because they're unable to manage the various struggles that they have in life. I hope that in studying literature that I can also have an effect on the lived experiences. And I think that literature is starting to reflect more of that. And also the expansions in interdisciplinary studies is doing the same. So I'll stop there and um, hopefully we we'll, can have a good conversation. I wanna leave a lot of time for our conversation. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sandra. And as, as a reminder for everybody, please post your uh, questions in the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. Uh, you should see a little icon that says Q&A. If you click on that, you can write your questions there. So we go over there as they come in. Okay, we already have a couple of uh, questions, Sandra. So um, here's the first one. Are there any strategies that we can use to transform popular perceptions of black girls so that they aren't considered adults? How can we prevent black girls from being equated to collapsed into black women? Thank you for that question, Dr. Harris. Um, I think that one of the best strategies for, for um, I'm looking at the question that disappeared, for transforming our perceptions about black girls is to just acknowledge their age and their immaturity and the fact that we make all these concessions for children in other, uh, of other races and other cultural backgrounds that we should be applying to black girls, girls as well. If a child is 14 years old, then that child typically is going to do some things that are not the best at all times. And yet we don't need to respond um, in violence that would be um, used in restraining adult men on little girls. 
we can consider how we might feel if those types of situations to challenge our perspectives about white girls, for instance, you know, and I think America and, and readers have a tendency to feel more concerned in that regard than they do for black girls, because it's one of those understandings, like the study that I showed um, suggests that we have trouble in this regard. So at first we have to acknowledge our biases, like I did in my own research. I had to acknowledge that I was biased, that I had been overlooking these characters, and then I had to do something about that. So I think if we don't acknowledge our biases, then it's going to be really difficult for us to not conflate, collapse them into Black women and womanhood. That's a very good point, Sandra. I think that that's where the you know, to, to acknowledge what's wrong before you can fix it, right? That's really um, what it drills down to, um, very important. So um, as a follow-up to this, our next question is, how can a mother of Black girls, biological and ad uh, adopted, uh, do, what, what can the mother do besides talking about the topic and reading about it? Is there any, any way to help change the perception? I think that Obviously, I mean, aside from like voting <laughs> and being aware of what is happening in our communities and with the people around us and being concerned for the people around us, I think just kind of modeling this, that type of concern and those conversations um, will also help. Um, I was very forthright with my daughter about those kinds of things. As I was saying in the beginning, I was, as I was looking for these books for her, I was also being very honest with her that there was a problem that there aren't more books, that this is not okay, you know, to acknowledge that th this is an oversight and people need to pay attention to it. So I think between those conversations and just modeling our own concerns for people in general, I don't know, I don't know anything beyond that that we can do to help change those perceptions because it is really a united effort um, that we all have to kind of work together. But even if it doesn't, become this large movement and resolve immediately, we can make small differences that will add up and I think really change the reality of so many Black girls' lives. And pointing out um, perceptions, right? That may not be, you may not be, or not everybody may be aware of what they're doing and they you know they're really addressing, as you said earlier, you know, that up front, uh, so people realize that's what they're doing, I think will be very important. Um, okay, uh, very related to the previous questions, what does your research say about why Black girlhood has, um, has merged into Black womanhood? I think that um, just colloquially, Black women, we have a tendency to call each other girl. And so in using that term, um, in a loving manner. I use the term myself um, to refer to Black women and Black girls. Um, but I'm also aware that in doing that, that at times we can think we're talking about a topic and not really be speaking to that particular topic. So if we're saying Black girl, it sounds like we're talking about African-American female children and adolescents when actually we may not be talking about them at all. And so I think there again, acknowledging just what we're doing and how our conversations are affecting, you know, life and our interests. Um, I think that's what has happened primarily, but I also think that um, there's been a dismissal of black women, womanhood, and the tendency to call a black woman girl, which started obviously um, during the time of enslavement, um, in the same way that Black men were referred to as boys. Um, so those terms have kind of been com conflated. And it, as I said, kind of causes us to feel like we're addressing a situation when we may not be. That's as far as I've seen in my research. Thank you for the question. Uh, the, the next question is actually one that I was uh, wondering as well when you were talking. Are, are you or others considering analyses comparing depictions of Black girls in literature versus media like films and TV? Uh, what is your initial perception about the differences in the depictions if they, if they exist? 
I think obviously books give us the opportunity to really delve into characters, right? So if you see a black girl in a book, if, if a person has written about them in a way that is really considerate of them as a character, um, we get further insight into their psyche. Sometimes we're offered thoughts that we wouldn't necessarily see projected on screen. Um, so, but I think that books and literature and media are experiencing the same type of issues when it comes to Black girlhood. Um, oftentimes, if you see Black girls in movies, they're the, the friend with the attitude that's telling everybody what to do, or they're the one that's getting into trouble. Or, um, and and we would, that would be the depiction of Black girls for so long, just these underexplored characters who were uh, just thrust into these stereotypes. And I think that the media is definitely shifting in a lot of ways. I've seen so many um, films recently, very, very recently, that are featuring Black girls as leads. Um, not nearly as many as, you know, the other, I think they're still very, very underrepresented, but the numbers are shifting. The perceptions that people are presenting are changing. And so I think that is uh, something that I'm, I'm seeing and I'm very interested in how media affects um, literature and how literature affects media and then how both of those affect reality. Thank you. Uh, so as a professor, as you're a professor, how could you use or do you use the texts you mentioned as a model for how Black girl womanhood shows up while also making sure that we're pushing back against our bias to adultify Black girls? And this individual here is specifically thinking of Winta Santiago as a hypersexual Black girl who is navigating a very adult set of circumstances. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. Dent. Um, I'm so invested in shifting this narrative that I am constantly reconsidering the text that I teach and the way that I teach various texts. And I have taught the coldest winter ever in a black girlhood class. And I noticed that many of the students kind of were applying those same stereotypes to Winter Santiago. And it's easy to. Winter's a difficult character to like. <laughs> she does a lot of things that that would make you dislike her. Um, but I was constantly reminding them with questions like, how old is she here? Um, what, who's around her that is a good example that she can follow? You know, how can she trust adults when she's seeing adults do all these really terrible things around her? And then could Winter be a different person if she was in a different environment? So I'm constantly posing those kinds of questions that push back against these very visceral initial responses to a character like Winter who is difficult to, to appreciate, but who is really troubled. And, and I think, I mean, this is probably, you know, probably not popular opinion, but I think Sister Soldier kind of misrepresents Winter as well. But I think her biases are apparent in the way that she writes Winter. And so then we also question the author and how the author has presented this character, has she really explored her beyond just the, those stereotypes? And so I think in the classroom, posing those kinds of questions to students and then giving them a range of black girlhood to see um, helps them to really address their own biases. And it makes for very enriching conversations in the classroom. I bet that's true. Um, how much of your research has found how Black girls are criminalized in our public schools? Right, that is, um, that I was reading the question and immediately forgot the name of the study that came out that was speaking about push out. Yeah, um, where they really, uh, the study is push out and they were talking about how Black girls are treated in schools and um, I think that much of the literature supports um, those types of reading. I think, um, so I've, I've seen that study and, and obviously I'm not studying education, but I think it's consistent with the literature. 
Great. Um, what can Black writers do to change or influence the shift in the narrative in media and literature? I think just keep writing. There's a portion of my um, the Black Girlhood Project that I want to devote to allowing young girls to tell their own story. I feel like oftentimes when we talk about Black girls, it's adults talking about children. And as we all know, or could possibly maybe remember, <laughs> that being a Black girl, you think that, well, being a child anyway, you think that adults don't know your experience. They can't understand what you're going through. And so I want them to be able to, to engage in this conversation. I don't want to ostracize them from this academic um, conversation that we're having. And so that is one of my plans for trying to incorporate their voices. And I think that writers, all writers, could just consider if they're, if they're not including a Black girl character, why? <laughs> and then if they are, do they actually know Black girls? Um, are they representing them in this very stereotypical view? Or are they offering them the same um, ability to, uh, to be expressed in a way that is more um, well-rounded? And so I think that all of those efforts together will just provide more information. We'll get more stories. We'll get stories from people from different areas rather than just thinking Black girls that means inner city black girls when they're rural black girls, there's Midwestern black girls, there's California. I mean, there's black girls are everywhere. So I think the more stories we have, the more representative media and literature will be. Very good point. Um, okay, uh, we have one last question here. So feel free to post more questions in the Q and A button, but. Uh, how very importantly, how can we get involved with your work with the Black Girls Project, and what are their current, what is the current, what are the current needs, uh, if if applicable? Thank you, anonymous attendee. I really appreciate that question. <laughs> uh, that is what I'm working on right now. Um, so, as I am trying to uh, revamp the site and make it more inclusive of various disciplines. Um, that is a goal of mine to try to uh, organize different outreach efforts or, or events and undertakings that would incorporate more Black girls' voices. So one of the things I've been thinking about is some type of an essay um, writing or um, blog posts and things like that. So um, send me an email. I'd be happy to talk about what you might think would be relevant to the project and, and we can discuss that further. I'd be happy to have that type of um, collaboration. With that, we're at the end of our questions, but I would encourage you what uh, Dr. Washington was just saying, you know, feel free to contact her, get involved with her, chat with her, and then go from there and see how you can, you can get involved in her great um, project. With that, I thank you very much. Um, Sandra, thank you very much for attending uh, this very interesting and important uh, topic. And uh, we'll see you next time at Research in Action. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everyone.